Total War Warhammer 2 first released back in 2017, and its predecessor actually made it to the number one spot in my top 2016 list, but I must confess I hadn't actually played Total War Warhammer 2 until but a few months ago. During which I've spent, shall we say, a decent amount of time with Warhammer 2, and I promise only a very small portion of that has been as the Skaven Plague Lord Skrulk. Now, talking about Warhammer 2 in 2020 means talking about a plethora of updates, DLC and otherwise substantial changes that even include 2016's Warhammer 1, so I'll try and unpack this as best as possible. At this stage, Warhammer 2's Steam page lists 15 different pieces of downloadable content, which is quite daunting at first glance, but notably almost all of this will be used by the AI and thus is present on the campaign map even if you don't own any of it. Most of these are specific new lords for existing factions or in some cases are comprised of entirely new factions and I'll go over my judgments of each DLC piece right at the end but when I first got Warhammer 2 in early January I started this long journey with nothing owned except the free pieces and everything from Warhammer 1. During this time Creative Assembly has also held a short beta called the Proving Grounds which I've also spent a significant amount of time with which really confirmed to me some of the flaws that the game does have but more on that in a bit. I keep mentioning Warhammer 1 because owning this is by far the biggest and most substantial piece of DLC that you can have for Warhammer 2, as it namely allows you to play on the so-called Mortal Empires map, which is essentially a hybrid map of Warhammer 1 and Warhammer 2's base Vortex campaign that includes all the old and the new races. That said, if you don't own either of these games and are looking to get into them, definitely start with checking out Warhammer 2 as the upgrades between Warhammer 1 and Warhammer 2 are simply too vast to count. Whether it's the magic system overhaul, the factions themselves, or simply general performance improvements, it's a vastly superior experience. My greatest performance. So let's get to the game itself. If you don't know anything about Total War Warhammer 2, it's a turn-based strategy title divided into two entirely different sections, namely the meticulously crafted campaign map and each individual battle map upon which your armies will do combat if you choose not to auto-resolve a fight. Both of these are substantial, and as I do tend to finish campaigns on the very hard or legendary difficulty setting, I find I manually fight about 30% of all my battles, with nearly all of them being manual in the first 40 or so turns. The game setting is obviously Games Workshop's Warhammer, and Total War is essentially a hodgepodge of different elements and timelines roughly around the now non-canon Storm of Chaos and shall we say arguably canon end times. But there's also unique inclusions, namely a much expanded Vampire Coast roster, which is one of the big DLC packs for Warhammer 2. Zombie pirates, essentially. Suffice to say, as someone who considers Warhammer to be a fantastic setting, I absolutely adore the creative direction they have taken with Warhammer 2, and the atmosphere is second to none when it comes to turn-based strategy games. The last time I found myself so taken in by the atmosphere during a single-player strategy campaign was probably 2002's Disciples 2 or 2004's Dawn of War, some of my absolute favorite games. Seeing a horde of aggressive barbarian greenskins charge my line of semi-sentient, dauntless skeleton warriors while my magical and oh-so-adorable Necrosphinx is having the time of his life simply never gets boring. Watching Hellstorm rocket batteries bombard every oversized Ratman in sight is an actual blast and the campaign map itself is beautiful and varies tremendously depending on what side of the world you're on. Where you start then is entirely dependent on the legendary lord you pick at the start of the game. If you own all the DLC, you'll have 30 different options at your disposal for the Warhammer 2 default Vortex campaign, and if you own none of the paid DLC, you'll have about 14 options. If you also own all the Warhammer 1 content, you can have nearly 60 different options for Mortal Empires. A lot to play, and even if you simply have the default Warhammer 2 factions, the Lizardmen, the Skaven, the High Elves and the Dark Elves, then you'll find these experiences to be drastically different. Even though there's two elf types in here, they're far from a simple reskin. The Proud High Elves have a decently balanced army roster, but with a strong focus on archery and generally fight better as long as they aren't wounded as a result of their martial prowess mechanic. Basically, they don't like it when their shiny cuirasses get stains on them. The sadistic Dark Elves instead strive the most when a lot of blood has been spilled and feature an aggressive but also balanced roster of potent crossbow infantry, solid late game frontline and strong hydras and dragons. The Ancient Lizardmen are extremely durable and focus initially on beating their enemies down in melee combat while transitioning into powerful charging monsters and eventually dinosaurs equipped with powerful ballista. While the backstabbing Skaven focus on swarming your enemies, utilizing stealth or simply blasting everything in sight with warp cannons and plague-based artillery pieces. 
As someone who used cavalry far too much in Warhammer 1, I was also very glad to see the free addition of a new Bretonian Lord who is playable in the Warhammer 2 Vortex campaign. And if you're in the purchasing mood, you can unlock a very unique Hunter-type Lord belonging to Warhammer 1's Empire and two entirely new factions, namely the Egyptian Undead Tomb Kings and the similarly not-so-living Vampire Coast. The main difference of a Legendary Lord is then their starting position, as this will decide immensely the type of enemies and challenges you'll face in the first half of the game, and it's very unlikely you'll have owned more than 30% of the entire map by the time you finish a 200 or so long campaign victory. But Legendary Lords are also different in their combat skills and traits. Aranessa, for instance, one of my favorite Vampire Coast Legendary Lords, allows you to recruit infantry with more meat on their bones, that essentially turn what is otherwise an almost entirely range-based faction into one that is quite powerful in melee in the early game as well. Furthermore, she has the potential to become a very powerful melee duelist herself. Alithanar, meanwhile, a free addition to the High Elf Legendary Lord roster, is a skilled marksman who grants his specific High Elf faction the ability to move in two different movement stances that are normally exclusive to Skaven, Dwarves, Beastmen or Greenskins, and not part of the other High Elf toolkit. This does, however, come with the issue of imbalanced experiences. Some will obviously be a lot easier than others, which I don't think is a problem, but certain lords do suffer from significantly fewer tools or unique units which don't skill properly as the game goes on. For instance, as I mentioned, Aranessa's pirates are powerful in the early game, but as the red trait stat line, the stat line for army-wide buffs, has no buffs for these pirates, they will eventually fall off as the game goes on. This is especially an issue for, say, Archon, the Tomb King Lord with access to vampire account units, making almost all of those nearly worthless. Now, as for the experience on the global campaign map, Total War Warhammer 2 doesn't reach the complexity of a grand strategy title, but holds up well compared to your average 4x game. By and large, settlement management is enjoyable and different across factions as well, especially the Skaven with the Undercity mechanics have a lot to offer when it comes to Empire management. Movement across the map is a double-edged sword, as it both allows for more interesting tricks and yet can also feel obtuse and at times annoying. Unlike most turn-based strategy games, Total War Warhammer 2 does not use a grid or hex-based map, and as a result of the diverse map design, you'll find some areas are far slower to navigate than others, which not all factions deal with as enjoyably. Once you get familiar with this particular brand of movement, you can usually pull off some genuinely exciting tricks such as blocking and forcing an enemy army into a bad position or actively luring them into a trap, but the road to mastery here is likely filled with tiny annoyances where enemies are just slightly out of reach when you thought they weren't, which can have dramatic results. Specific to the Vortex campaign, you'll also find that ignoring the unique victory condition is easily the best approach. Essentially, this campaign by default asks you to gather resources for a set of rituals that spawn Chaos Armies, which will invade your settlements. Eventually, this accumulates in a final battle, which will win you the campaign. However, there is an implied time element to this, as other factions, the Lizardmen, the Skaven, High Elves and Dark Elves, will perform their own rituals. That said, trying to outpace them is a tedious process and resource collection can be rather slow depending on your starting position, but you can easily ignore this race as every time an enemy faction finishes all their rituals, you're prompted with a relatively easy fight which will cause them to lose the Vortex objective if you win. Rather, going for the domination victory is far less tedious and luckily most of the DLC lords ignore this mechanic on the Vortex campaign as well. The only element where Total War Warhammer 2 really misses the mark in regards to the campaign map is the diplomacy aspect. I suppose it is called Total War, but diplomacy is often more annoying than it is enjoyable to engage in. AI is very predisposed to hating your guts, meaning if they don't have any other current enemies, they're very likely to declare war on you when they reach a certain negative threshold, even though it might not make a lot of sense. On the other hand, if you do find yourself making alliances with other factions, make sure to never enter a military alliance as the AI will constantly drag you into new wars with no real regard for the situation. No, this is not a mechanic that's remotely fleshed out and beyond aiming for trade agreements, it's usually not much of a positive factor. Hopefully, Warhammer 3 will at least introduce the addition of region trading because nothing is more annoying than finding a friendly faction has taken a city you had your eyes set on. The last negative element here is connected directly to the armies and combat aspect of the game and is by far the biggest hurdle Total War Warhammer will have to overcome in the future. In general, Total War Warhammer 2 campaigns get less enjoyable the longer they go on. A big element of this is the ease and power of so-called Doomstacks. Doomstacks are essentially optimal armies and unfortunately for a lot of races these are entirely built out of a singular unit type, which significantly takes away the enjoyment of manual combat. Not to mention, these Doomstacks are often so powerful they start to make even legendary campaigns quite easy in the late game. 
For instance, although I was biased against High Elves to begin with, I found I really didn't enjoy playing them anymore once I reached the point of stacking their Sisters of Avalorn units, which are immensely powerful ranged units that have zero issue dealing with any enemy the AI can muster. And in their case, they aren't even a final tier unit, meaning they're even easier to get than most Doomstack units. And the result of adding, say, a dragon into your army only to find it's generally less effective now is a real bummer. This isn't a simple unit balance issue, but is rooted into a lot of the behind-the-scenes systems, such as the supply mechanic that all factions, except Bretonia and Tomb Kings, have to endure. Basically, this system heavily promotes running around with a single army, meaning smaller armies of weaker units are almost always a bad choice. The Proving Grounds beta really highlighted how much more enjoyable the game gets the moment you take these supply lines away, as this now allowed me to field upwards of three different armies in the early stages and really made particular elements of certain factions shine much more than they did before. So luckily it does seem like Creative Assembly is aware of this giant limitation and will likely see a change to this in the future. Personally, I think the unit cap system that the Tomb Kings use is far more enjoyable, but clearly these are designed from the ground up with such a system in mind. Rather, a recruitment pool of some sort would do the game wonders and can be further tied into underwhelming campaign mechanics such as city growth. Without speculating too much, needless to say, this current tendency to create optimal Doomstack armies as a result of the campaign mechanics really hits the enjoyment of the late game. And especially some factions very hard, and I can't wait to see really any solution to this issue being introduced. When it comes to the combat, I find I rarely get bored of this, if only it's merely watching the chaos that unfolds. There are certainly a lot of different ways to cheese these fights, but a lot of this comes down to the aforementioned Doomstack issue, where varied armies are simply often suboptimal. In combat, it's important you survey the map you're fighting on, which means they usually play out ever so slightly different with the same army on each map. For instance, forested areas are great for your infantry to hold out in against large units such as cavalry or even larger monsters, but at the same time, if you rely a lot on archery, the forest is a surefire way to have your units miss nearly all their shots. Likewise, bigger artillery pieces need careful placement in order not to hit your own units, or maybe that's an acceptable sacrifice. The only prevailing issue during combat comes down to the bad habit the AI has of blobbing up their units. Higher combat difficulty settings already punish melee focus to some extent, but the blobbing behavior of AI armies means that archery, and especially artillery, almost always becomes the most effective approach. Of course, this does luckily vary a lot with each faction. In short, Total War Warhammer 2 is far from a perfect game, and the road to Warhammer 3 offers a lot of opportunities for improvement. Whether it's global AI improvements, the effective removal of Doomstacks, better auto-resolve tuning, or maybe it's simply an improvement to the currently underwhelming siege battles, I am confident that with the massive improvements Warhammer 2 has already seen over Warhammer 1, Creative Assembly will no doubt have an even more potent game on their hands in the future. I've now spent over 500 hours on both Total War Warhammer games, and I honestly still look forward to starting up a new campaign and throwing an army of flying Pegasus Riders or perhaps giant lumbering dinosaurs at my enemies. Without a doubt, Total War Warhammer 2 is massively flavorful, has an excellent varied roster of factions, and is by far the best Total War game yet in my mind, and easily the single player strategy game I find myself coming back to the most. As such, scoring this title is a bit odd, but I'll give the total package a 9 out of 10. If we're taking away the Mortal Empires or some of the significant DLC factions, I'd be more inclined to put it at an 8 out of 10 instead. Speaking of, getting Total War Warhammer 1 is absolutely worth it if just for the Mortal Empires element. This is a very enjoyable alternative campaign and by far offers the most variation as a result of having every single legendary lord in it. If you were to get Warhammer 1, you'd immediately get access to the Greenskins, the Empire, the Vampire Counts and the Dwarves. The last three have been vastly improved compared to what they used to be in Warhammer 1, but the Greenskins are due a massive rework. Particular DLC for Warhammer 1 hasn't aged that well, only Norska is still really enjoyable at this stage, Beastmen, one of my favorite Warhammer 1 factions really suffer from how underwhelming Horde factions currently are and feel far too outdated, and likewise for Wood Elves. Warhammer 2 DLC is by and large much better. If you enjoy a particular faction a lot, there's a good reason to get the relevant DLC for an expanded roster, but some of these are definitely better designed than others. Rise of the Tomb Kings, of course, adds the Tomb Kings, which I still think are one of the best designed factions in the game, a faction with a poor early game army that transitions into a very melee-centric, construct-heavy army as time goes on. Similarly, the Curse of the Vampire Coast adds the four different Vampire Coast Lords, which are all quite unique, and Vampire Coast in general has a lot of different mechanics to play around with. This, instead, is a very ranged-centric faction. The Queen and the Crone adds a new High Elf Lord and a new Dark Elf Lord, the Queen and the Crone adds a new High Elf Lord and a new Dark Elf Lord. 
The High Elf Lord is well designed, offers the closest modern wood elf experience possible, funny enough, and comes with the insanely powerful Sisters of Avalorn units, so if you're looking to complete the current High Elf set, this is a great one to pick up. The Dark Elf portion is significantly less interesting, but still a competent and different playthrough. This also adds the very powerful Supreme Sorceress Lords for all Dark Elf factions, so well worth using if you enjoy these sadistic, pointy-eared raiders. The Prophet and the Warlock then is a massive pickup if you're into playing Skaven. Ikit is very flavorful and comes with a lot of unique mechanics to play around with, while adding some very competent ranged firepower to all your Skaven factions. The Prophet part of this DLC, the Lizardman, is one of the harder campaigns you can currently play, but compared to his Skaven rival, ends up being significantly less unique. If you like Lizardman, this is still a solid pickup, but definitely feels like a Skaven-heavy DLC pack. The Hunter and the Beast, then, is the addition of the Empire to the Vortex campaign, which is quite different from how the Empire plays out in the Old World. This DLC also adds some very good early game units to the Empire in general, so if you've been craving to fight for Sigmar, this DLC pack is very good to obtain. The Lizardman portion is incredibly poor, however, as Nakai suffers from being a Horde faction, and Horde factions simply don't work as of right now. They get bogged down in tedious back and forth movement far too quickly and far too often, as a result of the AI colonizing every spot possible. It does add some very powerful Lizardman units, so if you simply want to finish the set it might be worth it, but otherwise Nakai himself is sadly very disappointing. And finally, the Shadow and the Blade is yet again a Skaven-centric DLC pack, and the Skaven portion is very unique and well worth it if you want more Skaven goodness. But the Dark Elf portion is a little bit underwhelming, by no means a poor pickup, and if you like Dark Elves a lot, go for it, but otherwise there's not a lot to say about Malice Dark Blade. And with that, we've come to the end of this rather lengthy 2020 review of Total War Warhammer 2. Thank you for watching, my name is Ben Haas, and if you don't mind, I did promise the Tomb Kings I'd bring refreshments.